In the final chapter of this course on evaporites, I want to review and summarize some of the more significant observations that we've made through the course to explain the well-known association between halokinetic evaporites and hydrocarbon accumulations. Now there are three simple properties or observations that underline the formation of salt reservoirs across the world. And they are that salt has some relatively unusual physical properties compared to all other sediments in the diagenetic realm, whereby it tends to flow and maintain its seal integrity. As it flows, it does not fracture. And this is in contrast to most other sediments in the diagenetic realm, which tend to fracture and respond by the formation of faults and fracture corridors. When it does flow, because of its inherent weakness, it creates a somewhat predictable set of traps across the subsalt, the intrasalt, and the suprasalt positions. The geometries that it forms are not simple thumb-like appendages. As Professor Richter Wernberg noted, salt shape can be weird and wonderful. Most are not thumb-shaped. And so it's very important that we utilize seismic and well-developed velocity models to forward model the geometries of the salt to better understand the positions of the reservoirs surrounding or even within the flowing salt. Now, as far back as 1888, old Carl noted that the origin of petroleum is always intimately connected with salt districts. Most of us would dispute the word always, but there's no denying that when you look across oil fields in salt districts or salt provinces across the world, there is a definite association between hydrocarbons and salt basins worldwide. From Spindletop to Gawa to Peter Thunderhorse, the oil and gas fields formed and sealed by evaporites include some of the most significant and the largest discoveries in the history of petroleum and certainly in the history of the last two decades. We know that before the salt flows, the positions of thick basin-wide salts, which are subject to flow, are predictable. The salt can flow early, and it can continue to flow throughout episodes in its later history. We know that thick salt forms at craton margin or craton edge positions. And to form that salt, we need proximity of the landmass, either undergoing extension or compression. We also know that intracratonic evaporites tend not to flow unless they're caught up in later orogenic episodes. We also know that there's a mesohaline source rock association with many evaporite settings. You can sign up for this free course on our learning site if you wish to. We know that once the salt flows, the salt body itself, although its edges may be subject to dissolution, the salt body itself maintains its ability to seal. It maintains its seal integrity. In other words, the salt remains tight until it is dissolved or it thins to the point where it can leak. We know that salt is a crystalline solid and that its porosity and permeability within 50 meters of burial are tight. And its intrinsic low permeability is difficult to modify, even when salt undergoes shear fracturing. And we know that the long-term stresses inside salt, because it's acting as a fluid-like system in the subsurface, are near isotropic. We know that even under extension and dilation, salt flow is ductile. Even if all of these barriers to fracturing are overcome, the salt, once it's fractured, tends to anneal rapidly restoring the salt to its original sealing condition. So one of the most important things about salt is its fluid-like responses to deformation and its ability to maintain its seal integrity. We know that salt can flow at all stages in the burial history. It can start almost as soon as the salt's being deposited and it can continue to flow and maintain its seal from the, from the time of deposition through burial and uplift. And it can even act post hydrocarbon emplacement as a body which focuses the flow of metalliferous fluids. Its ability to flow means that it creates shallowed zones on the seafloor, which tends to control the deposition of both carbonates and siliciclastics in realms ranging from the continental through the shelf into the deep seafloor. And this is true of both siliciclastic and carbonate sedimentation. So it tends to focus the stacking of sands or the positions of reefs. We know that it also, through its dissolution, can create diagenetic halos and cemented zones. We know that although it doesn't fracture, it can generate fracturing in adjacent sediments. 
And also through its alteration, it can create cap rocks, which also can act as a form of reservoir. So these poor fluid interactions between the flowing salt, its dissolution, and its diagenetic halos are ongoing, and they're going to influence both reservoir positioning and the quality of the reservoir. It can create topography. It can create anticlinal closure. It can create seal. It can create key gravens. It can create folds. It can create bodies of allochthonous salt, which are not necessarily connected to the original autochthonous salt layer. As it moves on, it can create salt worlds, and those salt worlds can act either as seals or as migration pathways. It can also act as a structural focus for the faulting in the overlying sediments. Clearly, Subsurface salt units that are relatively pure and thicker than a few meters can flow and they'll influence the geometries and the magnitude of subsurface fluid flows. With welds, we can have two styles of welds. We can have those welds which can leak and allow hydrocarbons to move across the weld. This is typically in welds which no longer retain any residual salt or residual cements. Or if there is some residual salt left in the world, or if it created a cemented halo, or if it created pinch outs, we can have the salt forming seals associated with worlds. If the worlds leak, they will do so in positions where the salt is sufficiently thinned to allow it to transfer fluids from below to above. Its flow, creating fracture halos, can also act as migration foci for up-salt face migration. And if we reach the feather edge of a salt body, either from its edge created by dissolution or from lateral migration of salt down dip, that edge position becomes a focusing for upward flow of the hydrocarbons, as we saw, for example, in the South Oman Salt Basin in the Permian. If salt is impure, it can also allow fluids to migrate through the salt. Or if we reach lithostatic pressure, salt can fracture and allow fluids to move through that salt, typically through intercrystalline positions around stressed halokinetic salt crystals. And finally, we know that salt in the subsurface can create drilling problems. It can create zones of tension above structural highs. It can contain, when we're drilling through the salt, a range of impurities which can act as local pressure sources. If we exit the salt, we can move into zones which may be overpressured. If we are drilling around salt, we once again have the propensity to intersect zones of overpressuring. So this range of physical properties and the alteration that it creates both within the salt and in zones above and below the salt can create problems when drilling. Most of these problems are going to be related to stress changes, which can be entered very rapidly, as can poor pressure variations, as we saw in the Albors 5 blowout, or zones of salt creep, or rubble zones, or entering zones of inclusion. These are difficult things to predict, but we should be aware of them when we are drilling above, through, and below salt. Halokinetic hydrocarbons are not easy. One must persevere. In other words, salt exploration is not simple, but the potential reservoirs can be quite large. Most of the giant fields discovered in the last 20 years have a halokinetic association. So, like this Marrakech monkey, perseverance pays off. Whether you're trying to break out a sea almond by hitting it with a cobblestone, or if you're trying to drill and discover a salt-related province, stick with it, and finally the problem will break and you'll reach the prize. And, as Carl Sagan once said, be aware, be ready to modify your hypotheses. There's no such thing as the perfect model. It always pays to keep an open mind but not so open that your brains fall out.